is a place for people. People that need help, and that's all of us at one time or another. We need different kinds of help, maybe. God Tell is not primarily a place to give people a roof over their head and food to eat. God Tell is a place whereby we can tell people about Jesus Christ. God Tell is a school. It's my school. It's my wife's school. It's a place whereby we can learn how to minister to people, how to love people, sometimes people that are unlovable. And all the people that cooperate in this effort get to be part of what's going on in God Tell. Now I have to switch hats. Are you smiling? You're not smiling. You better smile. If you don't smile, we'll get somebody over to make you smile. She smiled? Well, she gets to stay then, okay. I'd hate to have to say you have to leave if you don't smile, you know. By the way, the reason I do that, folks, is because smiling is a choice. I've seen people with broken legs smile. I know one guy had his leg cut off on a bush hog and he still smiled. But, you know, Christians can do that. Lost people don't have much to smile about. They're on the way to hell. You don't smile there. Well, here we are. It's Monday night. I'm still getting over my whatever I had two weeks ago, but <clears throat> it's getting better. We just finished several album projects, actually three. Two are going to be in one two-disc album, and then uh, another one that if the musicians ever get done putting the final touches on it, uh, these guys take forever. Some of them. I guess they're just not getting paid enough. I don't know. Well, they are, but you know. We're in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 9. For those of you that are taking notes, the title is still the same as last week, Potential Dangers in the Church. This is what Paul is addressing as he speaks to young Timothy, or in the vernacular we would call him Bro Timmy. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. These things command and teach. Let no man despise your youth, but be thou an example of all the believers, of believers, in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing so you shall save both yourself and them that hear you. Well, let's go back to verse 9. This is a faithful saying. Now, you have to understand, when the Bible was written, there were no chapter divisions, there were no verse divisions. This was a letter from Paul to Timothy, one of his young converts. And so when he says this is a faithful saying, he's not talking about just the previous verse where it said bodily exercise profits little, but godliness profits to all things. He wasn't talking just about, he's talking about the whole book. He's talking about everything that he wrote in this letter. These are faithful sayings. They are worthy to be accepted. Believe it, Timothy. This is the truth. Believe it. For therefore. Now, whenever you see the word therefore in the Bible, ask yourself this question. Wherefore the therefore, or what's the therefore, therefore? That was profound. Because the word therefore always connects what went before with what comes after. Always. For therefore, because of these things, because of the things I've been teaching you, we labor, work. Folks, you have to work at Christianity. Now, you don't work to get saved. 
But once you're saved, in order to grow, you work. You're not born spiritual. You're not born knowing how to love anybody. You're not born smart. Except for me, I was born smart. But nobody else was born smart. You, you have to be taught. You have to learn. And it's painful learning growing up and learning stuff that's good for you. And by the way, you know it's interesting, but you never have to teach a child how to get in trouble. You ever figured that out? They just leave them alone. They'll get in trouble all by themselves. They, they don't need any help. But you spend all your time, you know, trying to teach them what's right, what's good, what's beneficial. So we labor. We work at our Christianity. Not to get saved. Jesus died and paid the penalty for our sin on the cross. And we trust him. And trusting him is going to get us into heaven. But we want to be the best Christian we can be while we're here. And we have to work at that. Because none of us are born knowing how to do it. Even when we're born again by the Spirit of God, we don't know how to do everything. The only thing we might know is that we've got some peace in our heart because Jesus said he'd get us into heaven. So we labor and suffer. Now, folks, if you don't like suffering, don't be a Christian. You know, be something else. Just be happy until judgment day. Then you can do your suffering. <laughs> you know, it's like play now, pay later. It's the plan, you know. Or you can pay now and play later, and that's better, because that's eternity. In fact, I'm, I've already got my request in when I get to heaven for me and Jesus to play a little racquetball. Where's my sign? I need my sign. We suffer repro Why do we suffer? Why do people make fun of Christians? You ever wonder about that? They do all over the world. They make fun of Christians. You know, real Christians. Now, you know, nominal Christians, people that just go to church, they don't make fun of them too much because they act just like the rest of the world. But people that are real Christians, that their whole motivation is Christ and they want to see people come to know Christ, they'll get ridiculed. Why? It says because we trust in the living God. That's why. They laugh at us because we trust in God because they're so smart, they know there's no God. They know that there's no judgment coming. They know that you're just going to die and it's the end of it. Why would you want to trust your opinions and somebody else's opinions rather than what God said? The only thing we have on earth that God said is what's in this book. It's all we've got. And you can either believe this or blow it off until judgment day when you find out how wrong you are. I love talking to people who don't believe that there's any judgment or punishment, no hell, you know. I love talking to Jehovah's Witnesses because they don't believe any of that stuff. <laughs> they, they tell me that, oh, Brother Gentry, we're just annihilated. That's the end of it. And so I was talking to one one day and got him kind of feeling bad after I got done with him. I said, sir, let's just suppose for a minute that you're right. Let's just suppose there's no heaven, there's no hell, there's no judgment. And here I've been a Christian all these years, you know. But you're right and there's nothing after death. You just die and that's it. I said, what have I got to lose? And he looked at me and he said, well, nothing really. I said, then why would I want to join your group when I don't have anything to lose? Sure. And he just stood there dumbfounded. And I said, but what if I'm right? What if I'm right in believing what the Bible actually says and that there is a hell and there is a judgment? What have you got to lose? Man, he turned white as a sheet. He said, I got everything to lose. I said, that's right. I've got nothing to lose, no matter which way I go. And I'm going to tell you something. Being a Christian since 1971 is the best thing that ever happened to me, even if there wasn't a heaven. I'm still a happy camper. I've had a good life. Better, much better life than I ever had the first 24 years of my life without Christ. So I, why would I want to give that up? Well, he just kind of looked at me. He couldn't answer. Because you see, no matter what happens, I've got nothing to lose and everything to gain. And he has got everything to lose and he's not going to gain anything. He's just going to end up in hell. 
that he says doesn't exist. Just because you say something doesn't exist doesn't mean it doesn't exist. <laughs> Duh. You know? Well, they learned that from Charles Taze Russell. That's why he left Seventh-day Adventists and went to, started the Jehovah's Witness Watchtower Bible and Tract Society because he didn't like the doctrine of hell. That's what started the whole thing. So he just invented a religion without it. That was convenient, wasn't it? Yeah. How many people, how many millions of people has he led into hell? A whole bunch of them. They don't believe Jesus is God. You ought to read John chapter 1 over and over and over because it says it. Jesus is God in other places, but he's God. He became flesh to die and pay the penalty for our sin, but he's the creator of everything. They don't believe that. They don't want to believe that. And all the other religions out there, none of them believe that. Only Christianity, and it's quite a few forms, you know, different denominations. But all those denominations basically believe the same thing. <laughs> Oh, they have some side issues. You know, some of them want to speak in tongues. Some of them want to swing from the chandeliers. Some of them want to sit and never say a word. Man, that's okay. You know, I had a friend of mine that he preached. He's a preacher, and he used to say, "You know, I get so excited that if I was preaching in an Episcopal church, he said it'd make a saved Episcopalian shout." <laughs> he used to say that all the time. I thought it was funny because you know they're very reserved, but they're Christian people. Those that are really saved. Of course, some, like in all churches, just go to church. Baptist, Methodist, Nazarene, Assembly of God, Pentecostals. It doesn't matter. Some people just go to church. And they get kind of caught up in the excitement sometimes, especially if they got some really rousing music and a really handsome preacher like when Brother June comes by. <laughs> I was doing a revival. I've done about 600 revival meetings and one time, and they do this to me all the time, but it, it, this one time was so funny. A guy called me up, the pastor, and he says, how do you want the press release to, re to read in the newspaper about your upcoming revival? And I said, just put in the paper that Brother Gentry is going to be preaching. He's tall, dark, and handsome. I mean, I really don't care what they put in the paper. But if you're going to ask me, that's what you're going to get. <laughs> right? right? Why not? Oh, and don't forget intelligent. We've got to throw that in there, too. I mean, he was born smart. <laughs> you have no idea. <laughs> Guy asked me one day at this mall, and he says, what you know? I love it when people say that to me. I said, man, you ain't got time for all I know. He just kind of looked at me. I guess he wanted me to say like some people do, oh, nothing. I'm not going to say that. Sound like a big dummy. So we suffer reproach. Why? Because Christianity in its simplest form is about dying to self. Some of you didn't learn this lesson. That's why you were in relationships that you're not in anymore. Because you see, what busts up a relationship, a marriage, is because somebody doesn't want to die to their self. They want the other person to carry the load and die to what they want. That's why sometimes I have to do strange things for my wife. Like the other day I told her, honey, you can pick any movie you want to watch tonight. She picked three of them. They were all girly flicks. You said it. I did, and I honored it. I slept some. But... I like explosions and spaceships, you know. That's what I like. Let me do my job, man. And get you a zipper. <laughs> and sometimes dying to self means, man, you got to do the dishes. Of course, if you learn my secret, you break a plate, then you never have to do them again. She says, oh, honey, go sit down and watch the ball game, which is where you wanted to be in the first place. Dying to self is looking around and seeing the needs of other people and meeting those needs, even if that brings you into conflict with your own wants. I didn't want to be here. I don't ever want to be here. I've been doing this for 40 years. I've never really wanted to do it, to preach. I'd rather be kicked back in my easy chair watching Star Wars. 
I've watched it several times. I like watching it over and over because every time I hear something new. And I'm trying to memorize some of the dialogue because it's so intellectual. <laughs> we suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. Now this verse, part of this verse, has been taken out of context by many preachers to say what they call universalism, everybody's going to be saved. Now the Bible doesn't teach that, but they take this verse out of context. Well, he's the Savior of all men. Well, he is. He paid the penalty for everybody's sin, whether you accept him or not. You can never pay the penalty for your sin. Jesus did it. But especially to those who believe, because those who believe have got the inside track to salvation with Christ by believing. Believing is the highest work, John chapter 6, verse 29. The highest work of God is to believe on him that God has sent. So he is the Savior of all men, but that doesn't mean all men are going to be saved because not everybody wants to be saved, do they? And God will never infringe upon your capacity to make a choice. He will never do that. He gave you the right to make a choice. He will not take it away from you. I've seen parents do that. Son, daughter comes up and asks them a question. They say, you decide. And then when they make the wrong decision, they take it back. Well, they shouldn't have given them that choice in the first place, especially if they're just little kids because they can't make right choices. I know, we raised six. And boy, were we glad when the last one left the house. Now, Josh could have stayed longer. He's the good son. <laughs> but really, we were kind of ready to be alone because we raised children for 31 years. You know. 34 years. 34. Thank you, son. <laughs> Correcting me. That's right. He's right. 34 years. Solid. We raised children. And then we have 13 grandchildren and three great-grandchildren. We don't see our grandchildren very often, and that's turning into a real blessing. There's, there's, just, there's just too many of them. It's all right. Now, I love my grandchildren, but I'm, just not, I'm not even ready to be a grandfather. When I'm about 92, I might be. These things command and teach. And notice this word, command. It's not making suggestions. He says, don't tell people these are good ideas to follow. He says, you command. This is what you do. You want to be pleasing to God, then this is what you do. Brother Manley Beasley used to say it this way. He used to say that we need to learn to live what's written about us in the volume of the book. Well, the Bible talks about the volume of the book. We need to learn how to live what's written about us so that we can be the victorious, triumphant people that God says we should be. Teach these things, and let no man despise your youth. Now, this is a very interesting phrase. He says, look, this guy, Timothy, evidently was very young, physically. Maybe in his early 20s. But Paul didn't want to give him a big head, so he says, let no man despise your youth, meaning you've got what it takes to preach here. Don't let people put you down because you're a young fella. But then he adds this phrase so he doesn't get a big head. Be thou an example of believers. Not an example to believers, an example of believers. In other words, when people look at you, they should be able to see, Timothy, what a believer's life is like. God wants us to be examples of what believers should be. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people out there who call themselves Christians that are not very good examples. I had this happen years ago. It's been many years ago, and everybody's dead except one preacher of all these preachers. And he was the godly one of the whole bunch. He's going to be 90 pretty soon. I still call him my pastor. I went to a preacher meeting, and these people were kind of off the wall with their jokes and stuff. And Nothing wrong with having a good time being funny, but some of it was. And there's a lot of backbiting and backstabbing going on. I know you all think preachers are all perfect, but they're not. And so I asked my preacher friend if I could have a few minutes. This was probably 35 years ago. If I could have a few minutes to talk to the men. And he said, okay. And I stood up and I said, brethren, I just want to let you know something. Because I learned even as a young preacher, you can learn even from bad preachers. I've learned a lot of things from bad preachers. 
I've learned a lot of things from a lot of bad preachers. I've seen a lot of bad preachers in my life. And uh, I said, brethren, I said, I want you to know that I have learned some things from you. I said, and one of the things that I learned from you that I hope I never forget is that I have learned what I hope I never become. I don't want to be a preacher who's concerned about the type of people that are out there because of the money. I've worked in churches where pastors come and say, we need to double the size of our church. And it was just all about they want more money. You know? I, we were, I was in one church where we were running about 140 in Sunday school and about 200 in the worship service. And uh, the pastor said, we need to double the size of the church. And I asked him, I said, do you want another 140 people like the 140 you've already got? And he thought about that and he said, well, no, not really. I said, then you better quit worrying about getting more and figure out how to grow up this bunch. <laughs> What's the point of just having more people? And there are some churches where it's like that. I, I preached in a church one time in Dallas, a large church, and the church was full of babies. The pastor was all proud because they led the association in baptisms that year. It was a Baptist church. And they had uh, like baptized 200 people, which is phenomenal, you know, for any church. And uh, he, we were in this pastor study, and he says, what are you going to preach on tonight? And I made a big mistake. I learned from that day forward. I don't ever tell anybody what I'm going to preach on. And I, I, Brother Manley shared that with him one day. He says, don't tell anybody what you're going to preach on. It gives the devil time to come up with the opposition. <laughs> and so I told him I was going to preach on Christian maturity. And he, oh, we don't need that. You know, blah, blah, blah. And he went on and on and on. And, I, and then he says, why don't you just sing tonight? And I said, that's, that's what you want. It's your church. I'll just sing. He said, no, you better preach. I already told him you're going to preach. So I preached on Christian maturity. A couple of weeks later, or maybe a month later, I forget now, six weeks maybe, somebody from that church called me up. I was living in, of course, in Nacogdoches. And he said, Brother June, we just wanted to let you know that the pastor left his wife and ran off with the piano player. And I looked over at my wife. I says, guess who needed the message? The pastor. But he didn't want to listen to it. He was mature. Because he told me he was. But he was about as dumb as a wall. I've seen other pastors do that kind of stuff. You know? I've been cussed out by pastors. They didn't like what I preached. And I would ask them, I'd say, well, is there something not biblical about what I said? No, everything you said was true, but we don't want to hear it. So I told that bunch, I said, I'll never come back to your meetings anymore, and I haven't been back. Of course, now they're all dead. <laughs> now they're having to deal with the Lord over it all. So don't let any man despise your youth, but be an example. In word, that's what you say. In conversation, that's the way you act. In charity, that's the way you love other people. Didn't say like. I don't like any of you. I don't like my wife. I don't like myself. I'm glad God doesn't say I have to like anybody. He just said I have to love you. That means I got to treat you right, no matter how I feel about you. And some of you guys I don't like because you got too much hair. Man, if I had that guy's right there, he's not even paying attention. But if I had his hair, I could have been a TV preacher. I could have had those cards and letters coming in. I'd have been so handsome. Ta! And in spirit, that means what's in your heart. Because if it's not in your heart, it's not going to last long on the outside. And I've watched people do this. I've watched people run down an aisle of a church, make some kind of profession of faith, and try to act like a Christian and fall flat on their face after about three weeks. They just can't take it anymore. You can't act like a Christian. You have to be one. Why is a dog a dog? Because it's a dog. It doesn't act like a dog. It is a dog. And a Christian doesn't act like a Christian. They are a Christian. And people who try to act like Christians that are not Christians, they're going to fail. Just watch them a while. They won't make it. In faith, that's not our faith. That's the faith of Christ, Galatians 2.20. The faith of Christ. And purity, that's morality. Uh, of course, you know, us guys have to worry about that more than the women. The women are all perfect. They don't have to struggle with things like lust. It's just us men, you know. 
And people don't, they think that lust always has to do with sex. It doesn't. Sometimes you can lust after a chili dog. <laughs> well, you can. Yeah. I do it. I want a chili dog, man. <laughs> I want to go somewhere where there's a Davina schnitzel. I grew up with Davina schnitzel. After high school, I'd get out, drive my 53 Ford over there. For a dollar, I could get five, back in the old days, five chili cheese with onion. And I would sit in the front seat of my car all by myself and eat all five of them. But, you know, I did learn women have the same problems. When I worked in nightclubs, I found that out. You know, it's pretty obvious when women, sometimes who are married to somebody else, come up to you because you're the singer in the band and they want to take you out and buy your dinner or breakfast, as the case may be, because sometimes it's 2 o'clock in the morning and other things. Here, you want to borrow my car? Here's the keys, you know. <laughs> women have the same problems. They just express it differently than men. <clears throat> Till I come, give attention to reading, exhortation, to doctrine. In other words, do these things. Pay attention. Do these things. And neglect not the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy, the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Now I looked in Paul's writings trying to find out what this gift was that Timothy had. You can read about it in chapter 1, verse 18. You can read about it in 2 Timothy 2, 6. But he never mentions what the gift is. He just talks about the gift. Well, if you approach the Bible properly, like a detective and not a theologian, you'll learn to understand a few things because you start looking for clues to answer the questions you have. And what I found was that Timothy evidently had the ability or capacity to teach and to seek God and hear from God so he could relay those messages to the people. It wasn't a big gift. It wasn't like the gift of healing. You know, everybody gets hung up on that one. Or miracles. He never walked on water. Jesus did that. Timothy didn't get to. I've tried it. I can't do it. I did. I tried it on every kind of water. I've tried it on cold water, warm water, salt water, fresh water, ice water. Boy, I can walk on that until I slip. I can't walk on water. I've tried it in pots and ponds and in the bathtub. I can't walk on water. And Timothy couldn't either. But he did have this ability at a young age, he was a young man, to be able to speak to these people with great maturity, to preach the truth. And then he adds this, he says, meditate. Think about it. Meditate upon these things. Don't let them slip. Get them in your head, roll them over and over and over and over. If you meditate on the Word of God and you say you got a verse you don't understand, you meditate on that verse, you keep reading it and you keep praying it, and after a while you'll get some insight and you won't know where it came from. Well, later on you'll figure it out. Must have been God because that sure wasn't me. And I've had that happen to me so many times. One time I was listening to some tapes by a very well-known doctor of theology who read Greek and Hebrew. He was extremely smart. And so I was listening to him because he was not just that. He also was a down-to-earth preacher. And I was listening to him, and he said something very profound. And so I, I stopped the tape recorder. Back in the day, we didn't have cassettes. It was a reel-to-reel. -reel. That's all we had, you know. And I stopped, and I said, Lord, that was really, really profound. I wonder where he got that. And God spoke to me there in that room, and he said, he got it from the Bible. Why don't you do the same thing? Right. He didn't get it from as much learning. He got it from reading the Bible. Same thing I'm supposed to do. Same thing you're supposed to do. Meditate on these things and give yourself halfway. Is that what it says? Give yourself what? Holy to them. That means all of yourself. Give the, don't do anything in half measures. Do it all the way. You're going to be a Christian? Be a Christian all the way. Don't be a halfway Christian. I've never had any desire since I got saved in 1971 to do anything halfway. <clears throat> and at home, my wife won't let me do anything halfway. And she tells me to do the dishes. I have to do all of them. Golly, this is a tough crowd. When I used to work at nightclubs, I could keep them in stitches. 
And now I come here and y'all just look at me like a calf looking at a new gate. It's sad. Give holy to these things that your profiting may appear to all men. That means you're living the word and they see the fruit. Now, folks, everybody produces fruit in their life. Some good fruit, some bad fruit. Lost people can only produce bad fruit. Christians produce good fruit. Jesus said some 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 100-fold. Everybody produces some kind of fruit. Now, what kind of fruit are you putting out there? What kind of an influence are you to the people around you? Do you ever open your mouth and say anything really worthwhile? Or is it just nonsense? Like, what it is, bro. Like, people say that to me, and I'm like, what? You know? Or do you say the same thing everybody else says? How you doing? Good. I, today I was watching people, so everybody, everybody said the same thing. Good. There's none good. God says there's no, everybody though is good. They're all good. It's all good, brother. Everything's good. What does that really say about your condition? Well, nothing, because everybody says it. I wish someday somebody would just say to me when I say, how are you doing? Say, man, I got a pain in my back. I say, well, brother, let me pray for you. <laughs> you know? They always say the same thing. One of the guys who works for me in Nacogdoches, he's been working on this one group of people at the store, and he's got them saying, great. They, they all, every time he went in there, he said, how you doing? They all say, good. So he, he got them, to, he just kept saying, great, great, great. Now he goes to the same store and he says, how you doing? They go, great. <laughs> We're just a bunch of followers. We just do what everybody else says to do rather than even thinking anything through. Well, I want to have good fruit come out of my life. I want people to know where I stand. I want people to understand that I love the Lord and I want you to know the Lord. And if you don't want to know him, that's your business. I'm not going to chase you around and beat you up with the Bible. And if you want to go to hell, I'll smile while you're going. I will. Because smiling's a choice. <laughs> I can do it. <laughs> Take heed to yourself and under the doctrine, continue in them for in doing. James 1.22, be ye doers of the word of God, not hearers only deceiving your own selves. Now folks, here's where the problem is in Christianity. We got a whole lot of people that say they're Christians and they're deceiving themselves because they're not doers of the word of God. They're just hearers of the word of God. God doesn't want you to be a hearer. He wants you to be a doer. When it talks about dying to self, he wants you to die to self. When he talks about giving, he wants you to find out what you're supposed to be giving. Don't listen to some preacher tell you what to give. You need to find out from God what you're supposed to be doing. It may be less than that preacher wants from you. It might be more, I don't know. But if you find out what God wants, at least you can sleep good at night because you did what you're supposed to do instead of what somebody talked you into. Don't let people talk you into stuff. I hate it when they, you, somebody joins the church and the next thing you know, three people in the pastor corner that person to put them on a committee. He needs to be on a committee. Which committee? Finance committee. Why? He's a banker. Oh, joy, that's just what we need. A banker who has no faith, who just does things based on what he's learned and the principles of banking. Church doesn't run like that. The church is supposed to seek God, find out what to do, and do that. Well, you get too many people with too much education. That's why Paul said, pick the people to run the thing that are the least among you. Because they have to trust God. They don't know what else to do. So tell you, be a doer of the word. And if you'll do that, you will save yourself and them that hear you. Now what he's saying is that you will be saved if you obey the gospel message. And as you preach the gospel message, others will get saved. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. Paul says, I kept back nothing from you, but I preached the truth to you. The gospel message, which is, Jesus died according to the scriptures. In verse 4, Jesus was buried and rose from the dead according to what? The scriptures. The scriptures were the Old Testament for them. That's all they had. He came and he died and paid the penalty for your sins. So here it is. You've got to know some things. One thing, you've got to know you're a sinner. 
not just that you've done this or that or misspoke or had a bad day, but you are a sinner. We are all sinners. You are dirty, rotten sinners, and I'm a dirty, rotten sinner. We're all sinners. You've got to realize that. Then you've got to realize that, hey, there has to be a solution for my sin problem. Well, most people think this solution is do better. Never works. You try. How many times have you made a New Year's resolution, turned over a new leaf, and then fallen right back into the same garbage? Yeah, you know, we do that. I found out one time, I turned over a new leaf, you know what I found? The other side of the leaf. That's all there is, yeah. But when you recognize you're a sinner, you need a solution for the sin problem, then you find out from the Word of God that Jesus paid the penalty for your sin. You can't pay it. He paid it. And so you say, okay, what do I need to do? Well, he wants you to acknowledge your sin. In other words, I am a sinner. I have sinned. I've done this, this, this. But beyond that, I'm just a sinner. I was born a sinner. Jesus, you said you paid the penalty for my sin. Therefore, I'm going to trust you. If it, you want me to take you to Houston in my car, I'm driving because it's my car. And you get over in the passenger seat and we're driving down the road. What are you doing to get to Houston? Well, you're trusting me to get you there, aren't you? You're not doing anything except sitting there hoping I don't get in a wreck. Well, fortunately, Jesus is driving. He doesn't get in wrecks. You don't do anything. You trust him. But to trust him means you have to acknowledge your sin just like you have to acknowledge your need to get to Houston. You trust him. And you trust him because not only did he pay the penalty for your sin, but when they put him in the ground, they couldn't hold him. He came out of the grave. You see, if Jesus hadn't come out of the grave, then there would be no Christianity. You could just die in peace, but that's all. There wouldn't be any afterlife, nothing. Resurrection is very important. Christianity hinges on it. But what do you actually do? You don't do anything. You don't stand on your head. You don't go around and lift weights to get to heaven. You don't have to slide into third base to get to heaven. Of course, tennis, that's something else, right? <laughs> Father, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for your word. We're so grateful that you've given us a book. And it's the only book in the world that's trustworthy. And we thank you for it. We ask you to bless your word and the things you've written in your word to our hearts, to our minds. We need some discernment. We need wisdom. We thank you for the salvation you've provided when you clothed divinity with humanity. The promise of the resurrection for us because you rose from the dead. And we're going to go to a place that we can't comprehend. It's so wonderful, so great, so amazing. We can't comprehend it. But we do know one thing about heaven. And I've told people this over and over and over when they say, Brother June, why do you want to go to heaven? I say, because it's better than here. If heaven is heaven of all, it's got to be better than this. And I'd like to be somewhere that's better than this. We thank you for meeting our needs, giving us this place to be, food to eat, and we're very grateful. Bless this evening, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.